Great, so I am the other half of Ted and James. I'm James. Um, I'm going to kind of talk about a small application that is possible with Flucoma that is directly linked to what Ted was doing um, with this idea of sound mapping. And I'm going to talk a little more generically about the approach that is possible and could be used with Flucoma. So I sense many people in the room are already familiar with this, this notion of taking some sounds, analyzing them, and then finding a representation of them that is map-like uh, in a Cartesian space. Um, to break it down uh, quite simply into four big blocks, uh, we take some corpus of sounds. In this case, I glue together a big bunch of sounds um, from wherever they may be. I then uh, cut them up into small segments. This is a cheap way to take some blob of audio and then make little fine-grained sections of it. Um, I analyze each of these segments with any audio descriptor that I choose, um, and that's actually a really interesting both technical and musical uh, pivot point in this process, um, which we can unpack a little bit. Uh, we then compress the analysis so that we get some uh, what we might think of as magic numbers that describe each of these sound segments, and then we plot um, these numbers which are attached to a sound segment in a Cartesian space, which then makes it very explorable. Um, and you can do all sorts of fun things with it, like Ted did, um, drawing a path through it, or maybe using that as a, as a, um, a physical space to, to move around in. Um, so to demonstrate, I'm going to use some maps. Now, it's absolutely huge on this screen. So uh, I don't want that one just yet. So I'll break it down as much as I can. I'm going to sit because it's much easier. So this is a patch that I have been using a little bit for composition. Um, part of the uh, thing that I find interesting creatively with using these machine listening and machine learning tools is uh, using uh, musical resources that are beyond my understanding, at least manually. Um, I couldn't possibly go and listen to all these sounds in, in a lifetime, so how can I use the computer to help me navigate around them and find things that might be interesting um, to compose with? Uh, in this example, I have a big bundle of field recording sounds. Um, I will get them up. And it will be a good test for my audio. Um, so it's just a, in this example, it's just a free pack of really nice, high quality field recordings, um, all quite varied as well. So we have some forest, some shore, the dawn chorus, but also um, some more um, idiosyncratic examples of induction microphones picking up sounds from devices. Another example, or hydrophones. So there's quite a lot of material here. I mean, if I was to just go one up and have a look, there's 33 items, they're all about three minutes each. We already have about an hour and a half of, of sound to work with. Um, of course, we could go and listen to that manually. Um, for me personally, I would forget what happened at minute 10 by the time I'm at minute 80. I'd have to keep very rigorous notes. Uh, I don't want to do that. I want to have a way which is dynamic, explorable, and visual as well, something that can help me remember the relationship between things. And so, again, if we remember these four steps, I take some audio and I glue it together in a big buffer. Um, and this is made possible with a few Flucoma objects that live in the toolkit that help us deal with these kind of workflows. Um, I then segment, oops, not yet. I then segment those sounds into little chunks. And in contrast to Ted's approach where he took a fixed window, I use a, a novelty slicing algorithm to try and find, I guess, salient points of change and then create those slice points. 
Um, I then analyze each segment with MFCCs in this case, um, which gives me many numbers describing each little sound, which I then compress for each sound segment to two values, which then become my plot. Um, so I think with just these kind of settings that I have massaged and found by playing, we get something that's quite interesting um, and, and perceptually meaningful across the space. So I'll just put this on the output that we need. Let's check. Not loud enough. What I'll do is I'll go loud here. So each one of these small dots here represents a sound segment. Um, and when I move my mouse around and click, we get uh, that segment playing. So we can hear that bird tweets have all been located into this sound cluster here. And as I move around, some of the hydrophonic recordings have been smooshed together. But we also get a level of separation between different kinds of bird sounds in this corpus. So we have the, the more gentle ones here. Some higher pitch, more, I guess, growling kind of bird sounds. And as we move across the corpus, we get these different neighborhoods. Something more quiet and sparse. And so what's really interesting about this approach is uh, the coding probably took me some time to, to, to grapple with and to understand and to really feel comfortable with. But this gives me a generalizable approach to navigating through collections of sounds, as well as giving me some big levers to pull on to modify how the process works. And this is one of the kind of axioms that the project lives by, which is that we have these hinges that all pull on each other. If I change the slicing algorithm here, we might get bigger sound segments, which will change our corpus, which is then analyzed differently and will give us a different representation. So all of these things that we can push and pull on become part of the musical process itself. So I could, for example, change the audio feature to be about the chroma, so looking at pitch classes within these sounds. Um, and if I analyze, we wait for it to do 4,000 segments, and it will get caught up a little bit on some of the bigger ones. And I think what we'll find here with this particular corpus is that Chroma has not as much salience as MFCC, because a lot of the sounds are just not pitched at all, um, or they're quite noisy. So we have to wait now for UMAP to compress it, and we have a new representation. Um, and if I just skirt around, we lose that tight clustering of things. But there's an interesting shape here. Something with a very strong, perceptually uh, evident pitch in there gets pulled with other things. So we could actually change out the corpus and see how this works. So I'm going to go to my sounds. Um, and we could take some pianos. Ooh, didn't like that. There we go. Um, and this is all kind of tonal piano sounds instead of field recordings. I'm using the chroma, and we have a much smaller corpus here. Um, but because we're dealing with tonal material that has a harmonic structure, maybe chroma is a more interesting um, and, and relevant descriptor to use. So that's quite loud. So if we go... So these are kind of just pop recordings that I've chopped up 
again with the novelty slice, but what we find is chords from the tune end up being grouped together. Um, so structural elements that are similar get pulled together spatially for us. So it's not a pitch tracker. We get these weird semitone shifts, which to our ears are like, you know, well, that's really different. But, you know, this algorithm is looking at the balance of pitch classes. So it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be pretty good. Um, and it will get the top note. So there's that semitone relationship appearing. Um, and so this approach uh, for me has been a big part of um, exploring the Flucoma toolkit in my creative practice. Um, really working with these four big blocks to try and understand collections of sounds better. Um, and so in the concert on Friday night, you'll hear some of the works where I've been using this, particularly with dealing with um, what I would call big corpora of sounds, um, namely uh, this one that I've been kind of obsessed with, which is, let's see how many it is, 20, 22,000 ish audio files, all generated by turning uh, data on my hard drive into audio directly. So basically chucking a WAV header onto some bytes and then calling it, calling it a sound. Um, and so I will turn this down quite a lot. Uh, let's go to the sort of middle-ish sounds. And what you'll notice is there's both a ton of just noise, which is to me kind of boring, um, but some of it is really idiosyncratic um, and quite interesting. So, noise, something with a morphology to it. So you can imagine on a scale of 22,000 audio files, it's not that fun to just go through these and note which ones are interesting. Um, and so, I think actually at one point you can see the remnants. Did I tag them? I have, I had about four tagged and then I went, no, I'm not doing this. I'm not, not going to do this manually. Um, so, you know, taking this map, mapping them out. Um, and if I just refer back to my, uh, my thesis, this was the UMAP projection that I got from this sound collection. And actually, again, referring back to this idea of having big levers that you can pull on in the creative process, you can modulate the parameters of your projection and you can start to realign the relationship between sounds. So this green cluster here is much further from this red cluster. Or I can make them closer together or more dispersed or more compacted. And this became a kind of compositional prompt in a way. I now have, instead of a big bundle of unorganized sounds, I have some kind of um, grouping or projection of them with some kind of notion of what might go together by similarity. And Ted was talking about the interoperability of Flucoma and other places. So um, because everything outputs as a JSON file, I was able to create this projection and then quickly, using a small Lua script, turn clusters of sounds into tracks. So each track here is a cluster, which in theory will have perceptually similar materials on it. Um, and this is a piece that you will hear on Friday, but it's very small, um, is essentially uh, me taking those clusters and superimposing them to generate different phasing patterns. So I guess we could hear a small section right now, time permitting. Um, might not be so great in this room. But so all of these clicking impulse-based sounds come from this giant corpus of sort of unmanageable material. But through the help of machine listening, I was able to, own, to extract them 
and as well uh, separate them into little groups that I can then play with musically. We'll hear the whole thing uh, in wonderful 15 speaker surround sound on Friday night with lots more detail. Um, I have also one more fun thing to, to show, which I think again highlights the flexibility and interoperability of Flucoma. Um, I have been looking again through that corpus uh, for sounds where before they were cut up, perhaps there was uh, material with rhythmic patterns in it already. And so I knew that some of these existed. Um, there's one here called Knowledge C. And so if I go into my corpus, um, uh, yeah, you can see I tagged it like in 2019 and then I stopped and never did that any again uh, anymore. So. So you can hear this has a rhythmic structure to it. Um, but a lot of the Flucoma tools deal with analyzing timbral characteristics. Um, I wanted something that could look at the rhythmic um, properties, perhaps if it's got some sort of temporal regularity. Um, and I knew that in Essentia, there was a danceability descriptor, as well as a rhythm extractor, or a rhythm, a fe rhythm feature or something like that. Um, and so using uh, a library that's in development by Daniela Gysi, um, who did Bark and Cage and Dada in Max, um, there's bindings to Essentia that work in Max. So instead of supplying Flucoma-based descriptors, I just supply data from another object. I have another descriptor by simply copying and pasting an object, basically. Um, and so this representation here is based on a few rhythmic features like the temporal centroid, the danceability, the confidence that there is a rhythmic structure. Um, and then I'm kind of doing a reverse lookup. So I'm looking for sounds that I know exist in this space that have a rhythmic structure and seeing what's around it. And so if I just turn this volume down, turn this up. So I look for Knowledge C, which is that sound file we heard. Uh, it's over here. And so if I zoom in on my space, there's another sound with a rhythmic repetitive structure. So you actually hear these like kind of temporally similar sounds are being put together. And if I go back out, there we go. Something with a rhythmic structure, something with a rhythmic structure. So I'm using this as a kind of way of um, going from a position of knowing what's in a corpus to finding things that might be interesting and similar to it which is kind of like flipping the uh, previous example on its head, which is like, I don't really know what's in here. Can we see what's, what's around? So this is um, something I've been exploring this week, um, just kind of following the rabbit hole, um, playing with new descriptors and new objects and seeing what happens. Um, so that's kind of several different things you might do with Flucoma. There's so much more to explore. Um, to finish off, I think I'll point you all to the different things again that Ted wonderfully did at the start. So if you want to try out the code, it's all available for download and it's all open source. So you can go and hack it and you know whatever level that you want to play with it. If you want to write new algorithms, go for it. If you just want to put it straight into Pure Data or Max or Super Collider, do that. Um, that's all available there. We also have the Learn platform which is our um, resource where you can go and explore what people are doing with Flucoma with really long form, quite detailed um, articles written by one of our team members, Jacob Hart, who is a musicologist. Um, you can also explore you know, different algorithms. So if you want to know how um, UMAP works, which I was using to do the dimension reduction, um, you know, there's an example here of it working in real time and really explicating the guts of what it's doing. So 
learn.fukoma.org might be another entry point for you. Um, we have the online forum and community that we're building, which is great if you want to talk to other people. Um, and even if it's not directly related to Fukoma, but just in the world of machine listening and machine learning, it's all welcome there because we think it will enrich the experience for everyone. You can also email us, me and Ted. We're on the project till the end of August, and it's our job to talk to people, see what you're up to, and think about how we can help you, you know, use Fukoma and find something interesting and valuable in it. Are there any questions? None. Or yes, up the bat. Sorry. The ones that I showed today? Yeah. Um, well, actually, yes. This, oops, this one is a patch that I used in a workshop. So I can, I can make, it, make its way to you if you'd like to experiment with that. Um, but generally, we have like a few examples in the toolkit, in the packages for all of the CCEs. So there's plenty of stuff to chew on, including this type of thing. Yeah, if you find that interesting. Cool. And, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you are at the end of the, at the midst of the last year of this project. Yes. Is Fukuma going to be concretely lost, maintained? <laughs> you don't know? <laughs> well, the, the plan is um, we've set up um, continuous integration. So prior to that, we were like building the code and emailing it or like, and no. We just have a computer make it for us. So hopefully, the friction of development is really low in the future. Um, and we're hoping to maintain it as a community because we all use it. So when we find bugs, we go and fix it. The computer publishes a new version, and then we're done. Um, we are hoping to make a version 1 in about July. And that will be the kind of canonical version going into the future with a, alongside that, a rolling kind of development build, which is where the kind of cutting edge stuff will live, hopefully for the next 50 years or something. And much like Accenture, um, the core of the coma is C++, but it's actually completely separate from the Max, Super Collider, the wrappers. Um, so we're hoping that in the future, people will be able to approach the code and be like Daniela, like making a ears.accenture object. There could be an open frameworks Flucoma object or something like that to work with. So we're trying to do as much as we can, pray that we all really want to use it and ma maintain it as a community, and then seeing how that manifests going forward.